If it is better than that, I want to stay and make sure I don't make a mistake by walking out to something worse than what I can agree to here. When we use the word option, we mean possible agreements. If I'm buying a car, I'm thinking of getting one kind of car or another, I'm thinking of having uh, special features on it, special paint job, we're looking at the possible terms of an agreement, cash payment, installments, all those things. When you use the word alternative, we mean deals I can make away from the table. What other cars could I get? Second-hand car, another dealer, things over there. We're looking at my self-help alternative as far as this negotiation goes. It greatly strengthens my hand in this negotiation if I already know what's the best deal I can get down the street. As you look ahead, we want to understand the concept of your self-help alternative. What you will do, you want to look at the range of possibilities, find the best. That's your BATNA, your best alternative to a negotiated agreement. Now let's look at Bill Urey, help an account team prepare for negotiation by understanding their walkaway alternative, by understanding their BATNA. So I just have one question for both of you. What are you going to do if you don't make the sale? <laughs> it's not going to happen. No. I mean, there's, you know, no question involved. There's, we're making the sale. It's, we're ready. It's all we're here. going. We're all, we've been working on this for six months. It's all ready to go. Um, Dorothy and I have been, have been working our chops off to get yeah, this thing set. Okay, well, I realize that. No, but let's say it's, what is it, 95% sure that you're going to no, do the deal? It's 99% sure. 99%. We're not even looking at the okay, one. Well, let's just look at that 1% for a moment. Why? Because no, you don't want to go into that negotiation with one hand tied behind your back. It isn't. No, it's, when you it's, go it's into 25% a negotiation, you need of my to pay know this year, probably. what you're going to do if the negotiation fails. It's what's what's the harm in it? Let's take a look. <laughs> Preparation. Know your walkaway alternative. At what point would you walk? We can't. Would you That's take any deal? That's not even consideration. Would no, you take any deal? Going to sign this. Any deal whatsoever? Well, of course not any deal. The deal okay, that we so propose we're going to take. But what if they don't go with it? Or what if it's delayed? What's going to happen? Let's just take a look. It's just useful to take a look at what is your walkaway alternative. You're going to negotiate with more confidence. If you know what your walkaway alternative is, I didn't even know this. Walk, I thought this I was the sign-off. I, I didn't even know that negotiation already happened for the last six months. Yeah, this is supposed to be just sign on the dotted line. Yeah, I mean we're ready. This is a common and wholly understandable response. This kind of resistance to figuring out what are you going to do if the negotiation fails. In this case, these two have put everything into this deal. They don't want to even think about what is going to happen if the negotiation fails. Yet it's a classic mistake not to know what you're going to do if the negotiation fails. Knowing your best alternative gives you confidence, and that confidence translates into power. It's absolutely essential before you go into negotiation that you know what your best alternative to a negotiated agreement is. So, where are we? What are you going to do? We're in shock. Just think about it for a moment. Well, we can do what we always do. I guess it's mar market to some other people. Yeah. We'll try to. Okay, so that's one. Start this all over again. And who would you market it to? I mean, there are two people we planned on, you know, two clients we plan on calling uh, after we sign this today to start our next six-month routine. And, uh, you know, High Output's one, and uh, we were going to call P High Output. PD Design is the other. PD Design. Have you talked to these people before? I mean, we've made a couple initial calls, but nothing. Uh -huh. Nothing serious. We really haven't had time, given, oh, given the amount of effort right. we've been putting into this deal. That's understandable. But let, let me ask you. Could they, if you did do a deal with, with them, could they use most of the, t you could take advantage of most of the effort you've already put into I mean, we'd have this to, proposal? We'd have to structure things differently. The yeah. specs would be different, yeah. but yeah. Yeah. Would it be useful to meet with PD and high output before the meeting? Find out what the chances are for a sale? Explore it with them? Y you know the people at PD. Who would we call? Well, we could call their marketing right away. I, I could do that. That, yeah. that wouldn't be that hard. I no. mean, making a phone call isn't that hard to, to, to what, no. set, set something up? Yeah, we could. And do. actually have a conversation with them and yeah. some initial exploration? Yeah. Does that make you feel better? I, I mean, if, if this is a scenario that we're buying into, I guess it would. I didn't plan on it, but, you know, yeah, I guess it would. The facts are not immutable. Not only should you know your BATNA, but you should think about what you can do to improve your BATNA. What can you do to improve your walkaway alternative? Are there steps you can take? In this case, 
there are steps that they can take to not just know that they could go to another client, but actually develop another proposal so that they've got something in their back pocket when they negotiate. If something goes wrong in that negotiation, they're going to negotiate with more confidence because they can pat their back pocket and know exactly what they're going to do if the negotiation fails. That's the power of knowing your best alternative and of improving it. Now, for a moment, let's just flip the tables here. What about their badness? What about their best alternative to a negotiated agreement? Can they just go it's ahead and... It's not good for them at this point. Why not? All the time they've put into it. Yeah. All the meetings we've had, the specifications we've designed specifically for them. Well, Dorothy, they, they could if they... I mean, if they wanted to, they could go out and try to get another vendor to yeah, design... Yeah, but that's going to cost a lot of money and it's going to be a lot of time. And they have, you know, they have this end date. You know, we're settled on when we're going to go in. They've got the service contract, and I'm sure their clients are waiting on it. That's why we're sure they're not going to back out, but the truth is it's not a good idea for them either. They haven't pulled this as much, but other people have. They, they'll, go, they'll call our, over our heads. They'll call uh, well, our head of marketing, marketing and, just, and just yeah. talk directly to them. And what's your head of marketing likely to do? Unfortunately, if we don't talk to him, he may accept whatever deal they offer. Is that what he's done in the past? Well, well not exactly, but it would there be have been if, occasions yeah. when, you know, we've look right. like we've said no we won't give in right. and lo and behold we find out from through channels that we cut the price by 10 percent or something like that i think that we should have a meeting with hank that would be useful to meet with hank and, and let him know what we were thinking in case something happens okay and i want him to back us up yeah we should talk about how far we'll go and then have him back us up 100 okay. percent so that they know we're talking for the company knowing their batna is just as important as knowing yours it gives you a sense of self-confidence when you realize that maybe you thought their, their best alternative was a very good idea. But when you look at it more closely, as these two have just done, you realize that maybe their walk-away alternative isn't so good. And that gives you more confidence in the negotiating situation. This account team, knowing their bat and understanding what they will do if agreement is not reached, is now well prepared to handle anything that happens. Many people confuse the concept of a BATNA with what they're familiar with, a bottom line. I won't pay more than this, I won't pay more than that. Maybe you need that, maybe you want it, maybe you have limits on your authority, but far more powerful than any arbitrary bottom line that you yourself have set is the reality of what you will do if you walk away. What is the best outcome you can get for yourself without the consent of the person with whom you're negotiating? Let's see what happens in this negotiation when the account team meets the other side. John. Dorothy. Good, good to, to see you. you. Thanks. Good to see you. John, Paul. good to see you again. Good to see you. Sorry I'm late. No problem. So, are we ready to do a little business today? We sure are. I hope so. Good. Well, I've just uh, finished meeting with my committee. And we love the technology. We like everything you've done, all your proposals. We're really excited about it. But in order to make this deal finalized, you people are going to have to cut by 15 percent. Wow. Wow. <laughs> Not what we expected. <laughs> 15 percent um, is a whopping amount of money in this deal, John. I understand that. But that's what we're asking you to do. Quite frankly, I'm surprised that this came up at this point in the negotiation. We had thought that all the financial end had been settled earlier. What happened? The economy happened. I mean, to be frank with you, we discussed it. We, we feel there's room for you to move here. We want to get the best deal we can. Is there anything specific we can do to keep the deal we have on the table at this point? You tell me. Well, at some point we have to make a decision. But we do have other options. We have other resources that we could utilize. Oh, wait a minute, wait a minute. Uh, I just can't. I can't believe you even think about walking on a deal like this. I'd hate to. It'd be the last thing I'd want to do. John, really. I mean, we value your business. We've all been this together for six months. We thought we were going to sign here, so it's the last thing we'd like to do. But we have to be ready for anything, and, you know, we do have other options that we could consider. Or there's a possibility of shelving the whole thing if it just has to be worked out monetarily. Wait a minute. Maybe the simplest thing to do would be for me to give Hank a call. You could do that. We just got off the phone with him, and he, uh, he's behind us. He's seen this deal, John, and I think that he knows what's in it and would support it both on the technology side and on the financial side. 
but you should feel free to call him. He, he's there, as, as Dorothy said. We've met with him and everything, and, and he'd be perfectly willing to talk with you about this. Okay. Uh, I, I, I feel your resistance, but I think you should know. I mean, there are other vendors out there, and we have lots of options. There's a lot of other good products out there. That's oh. true. There are, but um, have you considered at all how much time it took us to get to this point and just to get to the beginning specific stage of design, what it would take with them? I mean, we were just thinking the other day of how, what a relationship we have now, the three of us. We and just starting off on square one. I don't want to start off on square one with someone else. It's the last thing I'd like to do. We, th we think it would probably be a disaster for both of us if this deal falls apart at this point in time. What do you mean? Well, we've invested months of effort, and we've had project teams working with your people, we've been around your plants, we've met with people, and we've tried to put together a proposal that makes some sense. Mm. We've invested both personally and credibility-wise an enormous amount of time in this, so the last thing we want to do is have it fall apart now. But we think it would be bad, as I say, for both of us, because as far as we can tell, this is sort of one link in a chain for you and part of your strategy to make yourself more competitive and to not do this now seems to us like it would would set you back a great deal the issue is we like we like the product the way it is you obviously do. we want to get the best deal we can quite frankly um, I hadn't really thought about my own investment so far in your proposal I think I need to rethink it is there anything you could give me in terms of outlining well, I, Perhaps on paper for me. In, in working with the different people to put this together, I've, I've put together just a list of all the specifications I understand that you want this project to satisfy in order to meet the needs of the people mm -hmm. down in the end users, essentially, who are going to use this thing. Um, that's all in here. Um, this is work I think you'd have to do again if you, you started over, and, and someone on your team probably wants to look and see how much time and effort you think it would take for you to do that. Um, as I said, we'd, we'd prefer, well, I can share this with you, we'd prefer that, you. that you not go that way, either one of us, but at some point in time, as you've mentioned, you'll need to make a decision as well. So that may help with some of the people on the committee. John, it would be good to let the committee know that if they want to change the terms on the financial end of the proposal, that's fine, we'll be happy to do that, but once those are open for renegotiation, all the terms are open for renegotiation. And I happen to have some people on my team who would love to do some renegotiation. I don't know if that would be the most positive thing to happen to the three of us right now. If we could avoid it, it may be in our best interest. But it would be, it would behoove us to let them know. I'll do that. So when do you think that you could come back with a decision? 24 hours? That would help because we need to figure out now whether or not to schedule some of the people who are currently assigned to this project. And uh, at this point in time, I really need to know from you guys soon whether we're going to go forward or not. All right. Well, 24 hours it is then, if you can live with that. In the negotiation, they did not collapse. Many teams at the last minute, many negotiators, faced with a last-minute demand for a concession, just give in. They say, oh, we can't walk away from this deal now. If you thought about your own alternative, and if you thought about the other side's alternative, you give them a little check. Give them some reality testing and say, you know, this is bad for you. If it breaks down, it's bad for us. Noticing how bad it is for each side makes it possible for them to get together, to reach agreement in their mutual interest. The key points in this segment are to explore your alternatives. Explore what you'll do if you do not reach agreement. See if you can improve them, and then consider the alternatives facing the other side. What is their Batman? Now we've been over the basic elements of negotiation. Finale. Don't take all these ideas and say, I've got to put on my getting to yes clothes and wear them like wearing somebody's suit that doesn't fit. I've got to play a role that I don't really believe in. You want to, as Bill said, get internalize them, get them, cut them and fit them so they suit you. So you say what you believe and believe what you say. So you're comfortable. And you'll become more comfortable uh, using more and more as the time goes on. We have found that these ideas work for us. We've seen successful negotiators use them with great effect. And we're confident that you'll be able to use them too. Good luck in all your negotiations. <laughs>
Well, the subject of difficult negotiation reminds me of one of my favorite stories from the Middle East of a man who left to his three sons 17 camels. And to the first son, he left half the camels. To the second son, he left a third of the camels. And to the youngest son, he left a ninth of the camels. Well, three sons got into a negotiation. 17 doesn't divide by two. It doesn't divide by three. It doesn't divide by nine. Brotherly temper started to get strained. Finally, in desperation, they went and they consulted a wise old woman. The wise old woman thought about their problem for a long time, and finally she came back and said, well, I don't know if I can help you, but at least if you want, you can have my camel. So then they had 18 camels. The first son took his half, half of 18 is nine. The second son took his third, a third of 18 is six. The youngest son took his ninth, a ninth of 18 is two. You get 17, they had one camel left over. They gave it back to the wise old woman. <laughs> now, if you think about that story for a moment, I think it resembles a lot of the difficult negotiations we get involved in. They start off like 17 camels, no way to resolve it. Somehow what we need to do is step back from those situations, like that wise old woman, look at the situation through fresh eyes and come up with an 18th camel. Now finding that 18th camel in the world's conflict has been my life passion. I basically see humanity a bit like those three brothers. We're all one family. We know that scientifically, Thanks to the communications revolution, all the tribes on the planet, all 15,000 tribes, are in touch with each other. And it's a big family reunion. And yet, like many family reunions, it's not all peace and light. There's a lot of conflict. And the question is, how do we deal with our differences? How do we deal with our deepest differences, given the human propensity for conflict and the human genius at devising weapons of enormous destruction? That's the question. As I've spent the last better part of three decades, almost four, traveling the world, trying to work, getting involved in conflicts ranging from Yugoslavia to the Middle East to Chechnya to Venezuela, some of the most difficult conflicts on the face of the planet, I've been asking myself that question. And I think I've found, in some ways, what is the secret to peace? It's actually surprisingly simple. It's not easy, but it's simple. It's not even new. It's maybe our, one of our most ancient human heritages. The secret to peace is us. It's us who act as a surrounding community around any conflict who can play a constructive role. Let me give you just a story, an example. About 20 years ago, I was in South Africa working with the parties in that conflict, and I had an extra month, so I spent some time living with several groups of San Bushmen. I was curious about them, about the way in which they resolve conflict. Because after all, they're, within living memory, they were hunters and gatherers living pretty much like our ancestors lived for maybe 99% of the human story. And all the men have these poison arrows that they use for hunting, absolutely fatal. So how do they deal with their differences? Well, what I learned is whenever tempers rise in those communities, someone goes and hides the poison arrows out in the bush. And then everyone sits around in a circle like this, and they sit and they talk, and they talk. It may take two days, three days, four days, but they don't rest until they find a resolution or better yet, a reconciliation. And if tempers are still too high, then they send someone off to visit some relatives. There's a cooling off period. Well, that system is, I think, probably the system that kept us alive to this point, given our human tendencies. That system I call the third side. Because if you think about it, normally when we think of conflict, when we describe it, there's always two sides. You know, it's Arabs versus Israelis, labor versus management, husband versus wife, Republicans versus Democrats. But what we don't often see is that there's always a third side. And the third side of the conflict is us. It's the surrounding community. It's the friends, the allies, the family members, the neighbors. And we can play an incredibly constructive role. Perhaps the most fundamental way in which the third side can help is to remind the parties of what's really at stake. You know, for the sake of the kids, for the sake of the family, for the sake of the community, for the sake of the future, let's stop fighting for a moment and start talking. Because the thing is, when we're involved in conflict, it's very easy to lose perspective. It's very easy to react. Human beings were reaction machines. And as the saying goes, when angry, you will make the best speech you will ever regret. 
And so the third side reminds us of that. The third side helps us go to the balcony, which is a metaphor for a place of perspective where we can keep our eyes on the prize. Let me tell you a little story from my own negotiating experience. Some years ago, I was involved as a facilitator in some very tough talks between the leaders of Russia and the leaders of Chechnya. There was a war going on, as you know. And we met in The Hague, in the Peace Palace, in the same room where the Yugoslav War Crimes Tribunal was taking place. And the talks got off to a rather rocky start when the vice president of Chechnya began by pointing at the Russians and said, you should stay right here in your seats because you're going to be on trial for war crimes. And then he went on and he turned to me and said, you're an American. Look at what you Americans are doing in Puerto Rico. And my mind started racing. Well, Puerto Rico, what do I know about Puerto Rico? I started reacting. <laughs> But then I tried to remember to go to the balcony. And then when he paused and everyone looked at me for a response, from a balcony perspective, I was able to thank him for his remarks and say, I appreciate your criticism of my country and I take it as a sign that we're among friends and can speak candidly to one another. <laughs> and what we're here to do is not to talk about Puerto Rico or the past. We're here to do just to see if we can figure out a way to stop the suffering and the bloodshed in Chechnya. The conversation got back on track. That's the role of the third side, is to help the parties go to the balcony. Now let me take you for a moment to what's widely regarded as the world's most difficult conflict, and the most impossible conflict, is the Middle East. Question is, where's the third side there? How could we possibly go to the balcony? Now I don't pretend to have an answer to the Middle East conflict, but I think I've got a first step, literally a first step something that any one of us could do as third siders. Let me just ask you one question first. How many of you in the last years have ever found yourself worrying about the Middle East and wondering what anyone could do? Just, just out of curiosity, how many of you? Okay, so the great majority of us. And here, it's so far away. Why do we pay so much attention to this conflict? Is it the number of deaths? There are 100 times more people who die in a conflict in Africa than in the Middle East. No, it's because of the story, because we feel personally involved in that story. Whether we're Christians, Muslims, or Jews, religious or non-religious, we feel we have a personal stake in it. Stories matter. As an anthropologist, I know that. Stories are what we use to transmit knowledge, to give meaning to our lives. That's what we tell here at TED, we tell stories. Stories are the key, and so my question is, is Yes, let's try and resolve the politics there in the Middle East, but let's also take a look at the story. Let's try to get at the root of what it's all about. Let's see if we can apply the third side to it. What would that mean? What is the story there? Now, as anthropologists, we know that every culture has an origin story. What's the origin story of the Middle East? In a phrase, it's 4,000 years ago, a man and his family walked across the Middle East and the world has never been the same since. That man, of course, was Abraham. And what he stood for was unity, the unity of the family. He's the father of us all. But it's not just what he stood for, it's what his message was. His me basic message was unity too, the interconnectedness of it all, the unity of it all. And his basic value was respect, was kindness towards strangers. That's what he's known for, is hospitality. So in that sense, he's the symbolic third side of the Middle East. He's the one who reminds us that we're all part of a greater whole. Now how would you, now think about that for a moment. We today, we face a scourge of terrorism. What is terrorism? Terrorism is basically taking an innocent stranger and treating them as an enemy whom you kill in order to create fear. What's the opposite of terrorism? It's taking an innocent stranger and treating them as a friend whom you welcome into your home in order to sow and create understanding or respect or love. So what if then you took the story of Abraham, which is a third side story, what if that could be actually an, ant because Abraham stands for hospitality. What if that could be an antidote to terrorism what if that could be a vaccine against religious intolerance? How would you bring that story to life? Now, it's not enough just to tell a story. That's powerful. But people need to experience the story. They need to be able to live the story. How would you do that? 
And that was my thinking of, how would you do that? And that's what comes to the first step here. Because the simple way to do that is you go for a walk. You go for a walk in the footsteps of Abraham. You retrace the footsteps of Abraham. Because walking has a real power. You know, as an anthropologist, walking is what made us human. Walking, it's funny, when you walk, you walk side by side in the same common direction. Now, if I were to come to you face to face and come this close to you, you would feel threatened. But if I walk shoulder to shoulder, even touching shoulders, it's no problem. Who fights why they walk? That's why in negotiations often, when things get tough, people go for walks in the woods. So the idea